Hi everyone, my name is Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer and it is that time of year where I sit down and I talk to you about my favourite books of 2022 so far and let's see if I can get through this in this heat without needing to rip this wig off my head. <laughs> I always find it interesting when it comes to to filming these because I get a good feel throughout the year for the books that I am falling in love with but occasionally there are books that stick with me like a limpet when I didn't really expect them to. Books I can't shake off, books that I keep on thinking about and then there are also books that I read that I appreciate and recognise these are really good books but then they don't stick with me and they fade and they're just not my favourite. So a case in point with that one would be Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. I read this because I read all of the Women's Prize shortlist this year and I appreciate that this is a beautifully crafted book um, but I haven't thought about it since I finished reading it. I don't know why, possibly the time and place of reading it, my head was in lots of different places to be honest, but I think time and place plays such a huge part in our enjoyment of a particular book, which I know is an obvious thing to say, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So, I have gone through all the books that I've read so far this year, and I have pulled, I think it's 11 off my shelves, that I'm gonna say are my favourite books of this year so far for one reason or another and I've put them in a vague order, emphasis on vague, but my firm favourite, I would say my top three are definitely my top three, everything else could move around a little bit, so should we dive in? Let's finish with my favourite favourite books of the year, so let's work our way up to those. First off is The Need by Helen Phillips and this is one of those books that when I read it I didn't immediately think oh this is one of my favourite reads of the year, but it's just clung on and the shadow of it has got bigger and bigger and I keep on thinking about it. I read it because I was reading other booktubers' favourite books of the year and this is one of Sophie's favourite books over at Portal in the Pages and it's not a perfect book by any means but it's really intriguing and it makes you think and because of the directions that it goes in it just makes you want to extrapolate and think about the universe outside of these pages and for that reason I think that's why it's haunted me. So this is about a woman who is a paleobotanist. So she works with fossils, she has two young children and one day at the dig that she's working on she starts to discover artefacts that don't really make sense. So they're relatively recent modern things like coke bottles but they appear to be really old and they're also different so the font is different to what she would expect to see and the bible that she discovers one day buried in the ground is different to the bible that she is familiar with. So we have these scenes which are slower paced interspersed with short sharp chapters which are extremely tense where she's at home with her two kids and she's sure that somebody has broken in. It is absolutely gripping, a page turner, it will mess with your head. If you enjoy the TV series Dark, I'd recommend this one for you. Next we have a short story collection. This is Things We Do Not Tell The People We Love by Huma Qureshi. This is a realist short story collection and in fact I have two of those on this list, um, which is interesting to me because I think I used to be more drawn to fabulous short story collections and I do still love those a lot but recently I've been craving more realist fiction when it comes to short stories. So this is just a genius collection of short stories when it comes to discussing family relationships and tensions and things you can't really put into words. My favourite short story in this collection is the second one which I think is just called Summer. Yeah, and it's about a daughter who decides that she's going to invite her mother on holiday with her family and she's really bigging this up in her head. Often her mum and her fight, but she's like, no, it's going to be different this time. She's going to come on holiday with us. We're going to bond. She's going to look after the grandkids so that me and my husband can go on date night. It's going to be amazing. But this is always what she says to herself before she spends an extended amount of time with her mum. And you know, like all family members, they know how to press each other's buttons and the narrator feels deeply inadequate and her mum will talk about things that her siblings are doing and she'll take that as a sign of starting a war and then everything will just escalate. The minute observations of family life were brilliant and that's why it is on this list and I would very much recommend it. Next up on this list, I had never read Octavia E. Butler before and I have now rectified this uh, and uh, berated myself for not having picked up her books in the past because as I'm sure you're aware, 
she is brilliant so this is kindred and this is a departure for me in the sense that i don't tend to read such fast paced fiction this is just a whirlwind for lots of different reasons pacing reasons and also because it's a terrifying book that moves in so many different directions and you're just not sure what's going to happen next but you need to keep reading to find out. This is about a woman called Dana in the 1970s and it was written in the 1970s too. Dana is a black American woman and then one day she feels really weird and she ends up time traveling to the early 1800s and as a black woman in the early 1800s obviously that is a very very dangerous place for her to be and she finds herself face to face with this young boy who is drowning in a river um, it's a young white boy who turns out to be the son of a plantation owner and as the story unfolds Dana realizes that she is pulled back in time whenever this young boy feels like his life is threatened. She has no say in the matter and their lives are linked. Uh, historically their fates are intertwined she doesn't really want to be involved in his life because his family is absolutely abhorrent but for her own sake and her survival in the future because of time loops she needs to help him um i don't want to say too much more about it because it's so plot driven but she keeps on going back in time and i did wonder at first that like, how is this sustainable Sustainable, but then something different happens one time and oh my goodness I have hardly ever been so invested in where a particular plot line was going um, no one could speak to me when I was reading that bit because I was like no I'm sorry but nothing else is more important than me finding out what happens in this bit of plot here thank you very much please be quiet <laughs> this book is frustrating and wonderful and horrific it also does deal very explicitly with sexual assault and murder so please know that before going into it um yeah it's fantastic i was gonna say i recommend it but i recommend all of these obviously because they're my favorite books of the year the next book on my list is one that i read i was gonna say by accident but that's not quite right because i did ultimately choose to read it but it was um, by happy chance because i was filming a video where i was reading books that were recommended by algorithms and this eater by rio de la Luz, was one of those books and it was actually the only book from that reading vlog that I ended up really enjoying. And it has made it onto my favorites list. So even though the other books in that vlog were not quite as successful, I'm still thankful for doing it because I discovered this writer. So this on the back describes itself as a novella about Mexican water witches. And whilst that's true, I think that maybe that presents it as more genre fiction than it is. This is a book that is very much rooted in poetry. It reads a lot like flash fiction, very heavy on the magical realism, which is wonderful. And it's about a series of generations of women and talking about, yes, the magic that they have inherited from the generations before them, but more trying to interpret their family through that magic so trying to work out what they share in their blood with people that they have never met and really is an exploration of intergenerational trauma just through this extended metaphor of magic and I just thought it was brilliant. If you're a fan of Carmen Maria Machado then I would recommend this. Let me read the very beginning to you. Great grandma, also known as Abuelita, died in her sleep. Her bed was in the middle of a forest. Yellow leaves sprinkled her bed. A giant maple leaf covered her face. Her long white hair spread above her head and reached the edges of her bed. Mushrooms bloomed out of the mattress. Mist permeated beneath the trunks of the forest trees as the branches looked down on Abuelita. We don't know how her bed got out there. We told the neighbours it was her dream to wander in the forest as a ghost. As a ghost, she can blend with the fog and follow rivers slithering into creeks. She can pick up after litter bugs and flick the backs of their heads. She can hiss into the ears of deers and ask them where the best berries are. She can follow hunters with their rifles to see if ghosts have more power than guns. It is so good. Another book that uses fable and fairy tale that I loved is this, which is What Willow Says by Lynn Buckle. And I read this because I read all of the Barbellion Prize long list this year, which is a prize that celebrates work by disabled and chronically ill authors. This reading experience was similar to Eatser in the sense that it's very poetic and I felt as though I was floating when I was reading it, as though the words were, were holding me up and I didn't mind what direction they carried me in because I felt as though I was in safe hands with this author. 
This is a novel about a grandmother and a granddaughter and it's about communication and deafness and through lots of just wonderful lyrical magical scenes in the forest it tackles in a nuanced way this huge topic of how you exist in a world as a disabled or deaf person when the world refuses to equip itself to communicate with you. So the grandmother and the granddaughter have formed their own kind of sign language and they see it reflected in the trees around them. There's this wonderful scene where they're talking about the branches of the trees doing their own sign language. And they've created this bubble for themselves, I suppose almost like Mr. Fantastic, just in a, in, a, in a different way, but you know, creating this kind of idyllic life for themselves where they can communicate really well. But the grandmother recognizes that she's not really equipping the granddaughter with the, um, with the skills to communicate with people outside of their immediate bubble in this forest. And she feels as though maybe she's being quite selfish by not allowing um, the daughter to, to learn official sign language. And she recognizes this in herself because she realizes if the daughter learns to express herself in that way, she is gonna have to learn how to communicate in that way too. And she's wondering why she can't just keep their private relationship. Uh, and there's a lot of complicated feelings cemented in that to do with internalized ableism and everything, it's just, it's, it's brilliant. And on top of that, the grandmother is thinking about things like hearing aids, disability aids, and whether or not that will be appropriate for her granddaughter, and weighing up the gain and the loss of those things, because obviously technology is wonderful, but the way that society talks about disability in the medical sense is always, how do we fix it? How do we make people assimilate into a hearing or non-disabled world? And there is a loss that comes with that, even if you, gain a lot at the same time. So it explores all of these things brilliantly. Um, and I think it's a really interesting conversation in many different ways and not to insert myself into the review <laughs> here of this book, but as someone with a form of external dysplasia, there are lots of people that I know, well, not lots, because it's, it's a rare condition, but there are several <laughs> people that I know who have external dysplasia, specifically the form I have, which is EEC syndrome, who have been born with extradactyly like me, so missing fingers, but also hearing loss, and have had to create their own sign language at home because they can't sign in the quotes official way because there's a lot of misunderstanding that comes with it that's definitely happened with me when I've tried to communicate via sign with people because I don't have as many fingers as other people do and the ones I do have are you know arthritic and shaped in different ways and it's not always very clear if uh, if I'm signing so I have talked to people about their own personal dilemma of creating a personal sign for themselves that they can use within their family, but then the jarring effect of that not working so well outside of their family home because it's almost, I suppose, like a dialect of sign language that they have created and how they navigate in the world. And I just think it's, it's a really interesting topic for discussion, but this is a novel and there are loads of magical elements in here and the language is just so, poetic and yeah it's great so I really really recommend that. I also recommend this non-fiction book which is called Frida Kahlo and My Left Leg by Emily Rapp Black. It is a very little book here so I won't say too much about it, I'll just say it is a memoir where Emily is talking about her life as an amputee and talking about Frida Kahlo's life as an amputee and their longings to be mothers and how their lives were different and also do mirror each other in certain ways as well. It's fantastic. Next up is my favorite book from this year's Women's Prize long list. This is Creatures of Passage by Marawi Yejili. It has folklore references, Egyptian mythology references. I would recommend it for fans of Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death by Selena Godin, because like with that book, this is an exploration of black working class lives. And it's about a woman in this case called Nephthys, who is not really in control of death, but feels like death calls to her and passes through her. She is this unwitting 
embodiment of of death and she lives in a town where everyone feels as though there's this kind of curse that is hanging over them and if they could just solve one element of, of horror then everything would be better a little bit like in Pet by Akweki Amezi you know there is something going on and it is making everything rotten and if they could cut out the rotten piece then everyone else could have a little bit of healing so Nephthys drives a taxi and people who are lost get into her taxi and she transports them across town her twin brother passed away a few years ago and she's trying to work out what happened to him but also as i said get to the root of something terrible that is happening in her own community i just loved it it's one of those books that manages to feel both ancient and contemporary at the same time next on my list is this anthology which i confess I haven't finished reading yet, but I already know that it's a favourite. I've read three quarters of it and it's it's fantastic and I want to press it into the hands of, of everybody. This is 100 Queer Poems and it's edited by Mary Jean Chan and Andrew McMillan. This is a collection of 100 Queer Poems by 100 Queer Poets. I have a poem in here myself, which is a massive privilege. I'm very happy to be part of this collection. And I really love how it is split up. So it's split up through ages. So we've got poems about childhood and then about adolescence and adulthood. And I am coming across poems by poets who I already know and love like Kavarak Bar and Chen Chen and Dinez Smith and Natalie Diaz. Um, but I'm also discovering poets that I hadn't read before or at least haven't read in ages and I'm very pleased to be reminded of. So we've got poems in here by Elizabeth Bishop who I have read before but not in years. And I love this poem by Kai Miller who again, I have read before but I don't think I've read their poetry before. I think I've only read their novels and it's called The Law Concerning Mermaids. There was once a law concerning mermaids my friends think it's a wondrous thing that the British Empire was so thorough it had invented a law for everything. And in this law it was decreed, where any to be found in their usual spots, showing off like dolphins, sunbathing on rocks, they would no longer belong to themselves. And maybe this is the problem with empires, how they have forced us to live in a world lacking in mermaids. Mermaids who understood that they simply were and did not need permission to exist or be beautiful. It is so good if you are looking for a new poetry collection in your life. Look no further. All right, we're on to the top three. Number three, we have Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Au. This book is under 100 pages and it is an exquisite book. It's one of those books that is so confident in itself. It says all it needs to say and then it's like, right, great, that's it now. I don't need to be longer. It's fine, I'm signing off. And I respect that hugely. This is a novel and it's about a daughter and a mother who decide to meet in Tokyo one autumn. The daughter is trying to organise this trip and be the mother figure in this trip to prove something to her mother and um, to show how organised she is, to show that she's got her life together, to prove that maybe she's better than her other sibling or deserves as much respect as her other sibling. We don't really get to know the answers and I love that we have all of these blank spaces that aren't explored that we as readers can fill in as we go. But the mother is just really exhausted and doesn't really seem to appreciate how organised the daughter has been and they're miscommunicating all the time and they want to be together and explore together but they're also very grateful when it's time to go to bed and they can recharge and try again the next day like they're trying to rewrite their relationship and take it on a on a different course i will admit that i probably loved it a little bit more than i would have done otherwise because it's set in tokyo and kyoto in the autumn months and i have been to those places and adored them in those months japan in the autumn is one of my favorite favorite things so because I could picture everything and it had that emotional tie to it perhaps that hyped up my enjoyment a lot which I don't say to downplay this book at all I just say that as a disclaimer if you're not really into maple leaves <laughs> in the autumn maybe you won't love this book as much as I did but Japanese gardens in the autumn and Japanese food in general when you need to warm up when it's so cold outside is just it's on my list of of top things that i love so if you also love those things and if you're also someone who enjoys a book that is like imagine a driveway of snow and someone has walked through it that's what this book is like you can peer into those 
footholds and you can look down and you can get a glimpse into their lives. This is not a book that takes a snow plow and clears the entire drive and lays everything out bare for you. No, it gives you some fragmented jigsaw pieces and says what kind of things can you imagine from, from these. That's it. That's your lot. I really enjoy that kind of sparse writing, so if you do too, this book, for you. Then we have this short story collection, which I've been sleeping on, because this has been on my shelf since uh, 2016, I think. Um, this is We Don't Know What We're Doing by Thomas Morris. And again, it is a realist short story collection, like with things we do not tell the people we love. I love a short story collection with a with a long title. Not surprising that my own short story collection has a very long title as well. So this is about a series of working class people living in a town in Wales, and each story looks at a character in this particular village. The last story is actually not realist and took me by surprise. It uses technology and magical realism um, and it I mean the technical term I think is it got me in the feels <laughs> it absolutely did there were I think three or four stories in this book that made me cry they just full-on made me cry they're people who are not used to articulating their innermost thoughts and feelings these are people who have been let down by society and by their families and they're trying to <sighs> reformulate themselves in their adult years and kind of comfort their childhood selves at the same time. And there are so many quotable things in this, just really quiet moments that I think describe certain emotions so brilliantly. This is one of those instances. Emma's stories often went nowhere. There'd be no punchline or moral or anything like that. But as she spoke, twirling her hair with a single finger, it just seemed like each story was a layer of snow she was pushing off a mountain. She wasn't looking to see where it fell. She just wanted it gone. Lots of these characters are trying to like, exercise trauma from their lives. And I think also this book writes really, really well about toxic masculinity and about the failings of the society that we live in that doesn't encourage men to talk about their feelings and then the impact that has on them in later life. So we have characters who are, who are married and are in their, 40s, 50s, and trying to work out what they want from their lives. And then there are also characters who are in their 20s at going out as a group of men and um, very much bro culture and how breaking that is. And I thought that that was written about in a very, very effective way and I appreciated that a lot. So yeah, highly recommend that. And then number one, which I'm sure is no surprise to any of you, is Eleanor Knows by Claudia Pinheiro, which is translated from the Spanish by Frances Riddle. This is the first book that I read this year and ends up being my favorite book of the year so far. It was my personal favorite from this year's Barbellion Prize long list. This is a novel about a woman called Eleanor, whose daughter Rita has recently died. Everyone thinks that she's died by suicide, but Eleanor is adamant that someone killed her and she wants to go on a trip across town to meet someone who she thinks can help prove her case. Um, the novel, I suppose if you describe it like that, sounds like a crime novel, but it's not really. It is absolutely a character study. And Eleanor has Parkinson's and this book is split into time periods where she takes her medication, which allows her to move. Um, and then she slows down again and can't move until she needs to take her next tablet. It is a fantastic um, book that really very realistically shows what living with Parkinson's is like, um, whilst also being a novel with a very gripping plot and also, I was going to say a twist at the end, it's not a twist plot-wise, but thematically taking the conversation in a different direction, which makes you reflect on the rest of this novel in an entirely different way. It is um, a book that looks at motherhood in many different ways and also caring for people in many different ways, how you can care for someone as a mother and then also caring for for someone who is disabled, who is chronically ill, um, and how just some people are not made to be carers or haven't been brought up in a way that facilitates caring because they didn't experience it themselves at home. It is incredible. I mean, it's my favorite book of the year. 
So those are all of the books that I wanted to talk to you about today. I will list them in the description box down below in case that is helpful. I would love to know in a comment down below what your favourite books of this year have been so far. If you have read any of these or if you would like to now. Um, if you're new and you enjoyed this video, I would love for you to stick around and subscribe. If you enjoy my content on here and are able to support me on Patreon and would like to, that is also very much appreciated as well. Support over on Patreon means I can keep creating free content for everyone, making sure that that's accessible and all of that jazz. Link to that is in the description box down below as well. Thank you for joining me. I hope you're all doing okay and I will see you very soon. Bye.